Welcome to episode 85 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Herman Groman, who served in the FBI for 25 years. While in the Bureau, Groman specialized in working deep, long-term undercover operations as an undercover agent in the areas of organized crime and narcotics. In this episode, he reviews the case of FBI informant Richie Worsey Jr., also known as White Boy Rick, who, at the age of 17, was convicted of selling large quantities of cocaine and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Later in his FBI career, Herman Groman was assigned to lead several high-profile public corruption investigations. He was also the team leader of one of the FBI's special operation groups, SOG, which is a specialized group conducting surveillances of major terrorist cell groups and their associates. After retiring from the FBI, Groman served as the director of security at a large Las Vegas casino hotel for several years. He is the author of Pigeon Spring, a crime novel featuring his fictionalized alter ego, former FBI agent Matt Steele, who coincidentally also takes a job as director of security at a major Las Vegas casino. This is a fascinating case review, and you'll find out during it that this case is going to be a feature film to be released in January starring Matthew McConaughey. So you know it's going to have a lot of great twists and turns. But before we get to that interview... I want to thank you for your emails congratulating me on reaching 1 million downloads. This milestone means so much to me, and it really has nothing to do with the podcast itself or my efforts. It means so much to me because the podcast serves to assure you of the FBI's independence and integrity, and the fact that you continue to listen, continue to want to know that the FBI is there for the nation means so much more to me. As a matter of fact, I was at a retired agent's luncheon today, and our guest speaker was a foreign counterintelligence supervisor in Philadelphia. And one of the things he talked about today was that trust in the government is at an all-time low. And I'm sure you've seen news clips about the unrest in the 60s and the 70s. Well, in 2017, it is believed that distrust in the government is worse than it was back then. And that is just mind-boggling. So that's why this is so important to me. That supervisor said, decisions are made by those who show up. And so by listening to these episodes, by hearing from the case agents themselves, you can make decisions about the FBI and hopefully about the government in this country because you showed up and got the information. So that's why I'm proud of 1 million downloads. And that's why I'm so grateful that you show up every week. Thank you. I do also want to let you know that I did post an article on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn about the five lessons I've learned from producing and hosting a weekly podcast. So please look out for that. It's also, of course, posted on my website. I want to give a big shout out to Javier over at Pretend Radio Podcast. It's a documentary type podcast about real people pretending to be someone else. And he did a fantastic job interviewing Mark Ruskin. Remember, Mark was interviewed in episode 81 of FBI Retired Case File Review about his 
false flag undercover case. The pretend radio podcast episode is a look at a totally different undercover role Mark played. So you might want to check that out. Last thing, I want to thank you for picking up a copy of Pay to Play, my FBI crime thriller about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play, you're helping to defray the cost of me producing ad-free content. So thank you, and here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest today, Herman Groman. Hi, Herman. How are you? Hey, Jerry. What's going on? Well, I can tell you what's going on. It's the case of White Boy Rick. I've been yeah. hearing so much about it, and I heard that the case, the story behind White Boy Rick, who you will identify to us in more detail in just a second, right. uh, but I heard that it's even going to be a feature film starring Matthew McConaughey. That's right. I mean, if the case is worthy of a having its own feature film, then it certainly is worthy of having an episode on FBI Retired Case File Review. Well, great. It's an honor. It's uh, good to be here. Um, In fact, the uh, movie is uh, finished with uh, the filming and production. It's due for release on January 26th, and it will be called White Boy Rick. Give us just a little tease, and then I want to backtrack a bit, but give us just a little tease. Who is White Boy Rick, and what does he have to do with the FBI and Herman Groman. Yeah, you know it's a, it's kind of a convoluted story. It's a, a story as you know most most good stories are, but it dates back into the uh, middle 1980s when I was assigned as a uh, an agent in the Detroit field office, and uh, Wershe's father, uh, uh, Richard Wershe Sr., uh, was uh, an informant that I inherited. And uh, he had a son, Richard Worshi Jr., a.k.a. White Boy Rick, who subsequently became a uh, cooperating witness and uh, an informant uh, along the lines which led to a major public corruption investigation and a sentence of life in prison for him with no chance of parole, which has since been amended. So it's an interesting, convoluted story. He's become sort of a, uh, um, you know, folk legend especially around the uh, Midwest, partly because of his street name and uh, also because of the injustice that surrounds the case, which I'll talk about um, at at some point. All right. Well, give us a little background about you. I mean, how did you end up in the FBI in the Detroit division? Well, they decided they needed another extremely handsome agent in uh, Detroit. (laughs) So... No, uh, you know, I graduated from the academy in 1980, and uh, prior to that, I'd had about uh, eight years of uh, state and local law enforcement experience, and, uh, you know, had uh, worked in a uh, drug unit with the state of Ohio for a number of years, and really in 1980, uh, there wasn't much going on in terms of uh, undercover type stuff, and we, of course, didn't have concurrent jurisdiction yet with DEA. Uh, That came in 1982, uh, you may recall. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, when I uh, completed the academy, I was assigned to the Pittsburgh Division, and I ended up in um, uh, West Virginia. And uh, because of I, you know, I had some background in undercover stuff, uh, ended up uh, working uh, an undercover public corruption case down there that where we operated a nightclub where we had a, a gambling operation in the back room. Our ASAC was a guy by the name of Tony Daniels, and I'm sure you've heard of Tony and many of your audience has and called me in the office one day and said, Hey, uh, you know, we've got this ongoing case uh, down in Florida that I was a supervisor on. And a lot of the stuff that these guys are currently involved in, you're going to be facing in this operation. So I want you to go down there and hang out with this guy by the name of Joe Pistone. So <laughs> that's how I, I kind of got involved in, in a lot of this stuff. And I really didn't have any operational stuff to do in that in that case, but it gave me a real appreciation for the depth of the investigations, especially these undercover investigations that the FBI would get involved in. So uh, after about a year or so in Pittsburgh, I got transferred to Detroit. And at about the same time, uh, we had inherited Title 21 jurisdiction 
uh, to work drug cases. And so that's kind of kind of my background very briefly as it applies to Detroit. And then uh, I was there for about 12 years and then uh, eventually uh, got to uh, Las Vegas on the transfer, uh, which is where I'm retired from. I uh, worked a lot of under, deep undercover type stuff uh, with a mob and eventually ended up on uh, SOG, uh, where I retired, and then uh, took over for about seven years as the security director for one of the large casinos here. And now I'm enjoying the fruits of my labor, fully retired. Excellent. All right, so let's now go back in time to Detroit. Sure. When was the first time that you became aware of White Boy Rick? Should we call him White Boy Rick, or should we call him by his... Uh, by yeah. his uh, given name. Yeah, you know, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of controversy attached to the uh, name White Boy Rick. Uh, a lot of his advocates um, resent the name because they don't think it really, you know, reflects who he really is. Uh, it's kind of like uh, calling whatever Babyface Nelson's name was Babyface. But uh, I certainly don't mind it. I mean, it's uh, it's a name that I'm comfortable with, and uh, so. White Boy Rick uh, Worshi Jr. Uh, was about um, about 15 years old when I met him. Uh, I was introduced by uh, another agent who had been working the father, and um, we met at the McDonald's on the west side of uh, Detroit. And so I started debriefing uh, the father about a drug organization called the Curry Drug Gang uh, that is kind of a focal point in this uh, uh, this whole White Boy Rick story. Anyway, I had the ticket on uh, on the Curry brothers, and uh, Worshi Sr. Uh, seemed to have information on it. So as I'm uh, debriefing the uh, father, I noticed a lot of times he would defer to the kid about certain specifics. And finally, I realized, well, the real source of the information on this Curry drug investigation is not really the father. It's the kid. So that's how I met him. And uh, by the time he was uh, uh, 17... Uh, he became uh, uh, kind of an independent drug uh, wholesaler, and eventually he was caught with about uh, 17 pounds of coke in Michigan at the time. They had what they called a 650 law, and that meant that if you were caught in possession, just mere possession of 650 grams of cocaine, about a pound and a half of cocaine, that you were subject to life imprisonment, no chance of parole. And, uh, you know, the law was well-intended, but uh, really didn't catch the big kingpins that were bringing in truckloads of the stuff. Uh, but anyway, he was a high-profile character at the time. The news media loved the name White Boy Rick, and he became kind of an ur- urban legend. And uh, eventually uh, he was convicted in state court, uh, received a life sentence. And uh, during the course of the drug investigation, uh, backstepping a little bit, you know, it was a very violent drug gang, and um, one of the homicides that was committed was by uh, certain members of the Curry gang, and it was a drive-by shooting that uh, accidentally shot and killed a 13-year-old boy by the name of Damian Lucas in the drive-by shooting. Eventually, the Curry drug investigation pretty well determined that there was um, a cover-up of the homicide. In fact, they... Uh, even uh, arrested uh, um, basically an individual, um, an innocent individual by the name of Lakeish Davis. Well, I had uh, wiretap intercepts. I had uh, some information, other information that corroborated uh, that who really did the killing. And uh, also, uh, Worshi Jr., white boy Rick, had contacted me and told me that he was present when a discussion about this homicide had taken place and uh, so I disseminated this information to the Detroit homicide section, and of course nothing happened. And um, so Lakish Davis uh, remained in jail, and uh, we were preparing to try to try him on the first degree murder charge. So eventually I divulged the information to the uh, defense attorney, and I ended up in court. And uh, essentially I was ordered to divulge the source of the information, which I refused to do. And I was threatened with contempt. And I'll never forget, it was kind of funny because I had to have representation by the United States Attorney's Office uh, during one of the court hearings. And I'll never forget, so we pulled up to the uh, federal courthouse to pick up the U.S. Attorney, and uh, she got in. Her name was Trish. 
And I said, well, Trish, how do you feel? You feel ready to defend me, keep you out of jail? She said, well, I've been thinking about this case all night long, and I've come to the conclusion I think you're going to need this. And she handed me a toothbrush. <laughs> not a good sign. Not, not a, a good, good sign. sign. Let me ask yeah. you a question, because you said that <laughs> there was a cover-up. Could you go into a little bit more detail of who was engaged in this cover-up and yeah, why I, they would do that? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, um, as I said at the onset, it uh, becomes a convoluted story. But uh, Johnny Curry, as it turns out, was uh, married to uh, Mayor Coleman Young at the time of the city of Detroit, his favorite niece. Her name was Kathy Bolson. And so he had gained some political clout. And Kathy Bolson had a, uh, you know, a long history of uh, being addicted to cocaine and other drugs and so forth. And so there were certain members of the police department that were assigned to keep her out of trouble, basically. And... Uh, and so when this drive-by shooting took place, um, I found out, of course, later on by interviewing Johnny Curry while he was in prison and others uh, that Johnny Curry had got together with Kathy Volson and went down to see the head of the homicide section, who was Gil Hill. Now, Gil Hill, you may recall, uh, was an interesting character. Uh, later on, uh, after being the commander of the homicide section, he went on to become a city councilman and also ran for mayor. But really, what he was famous for, you may recall, that in the Eddie Murphy movies, Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2, uh, his profane boss, who was always yelling at Eddie Murphy to get get his ass back to Detroit and uh, so forth, that's Gil Hill. Anyway, oh, Johnny really? So that wasn't an actor? No, no. And in, in fact, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, the film producers... Uh, kind of hired him to be uh, sort of an advisor on the film. And when he started essentially acting for him, they said, wow, you're better than any actor we've got, which he was. So later on, um, when Johnny Curry was in prison, federal prison in Texas, a reporter by the name of uh, Vince Wade, a television reporter, had done a seven-part series on who killed Damian Lucas, the 13-year-old kid. And it was a pretty compelling uh, story. had a lot of video in it and had some audio of his younger brother calling 911, you know, pleading for help. It was very heart-wrenching. And so I took that video uh, from that newscast, and I went down to visit Johnny Curry, and I basically told him, I said, hey, I know that you didn't do this, but I also know that you know all about it. So all I'm asking you is that tell me how the thing was covered up. So he told me we had corroborating information through pen registers and wiretaps and so forth to corroborate what he told me. He told me that when this whole incident happened, he went to um, Kathy, his wife, who contacted Sergeant James Harris with the police department, uh, who had a lot of political clout and was pretty tight with Gil Hill and had worked in the homicide section. And he arranged for a meeting to take place at uh, Detroit in the homicide section. So Curry told me that he uh, took $10,000. Uh, he went down with Kathy, walked into the office, met with Gil. He gave him the $10,000, and they had a discussion about the Damian Lucas homicide. And Gil Hill instructed him to just lay low, and we'll take care of it. So that's the information he gave me. And again, it was corroborated by other independent investigation. So it really had uh, some strength to it. So later on, after the Curry drug investigation, I transferred to, to a public corruption squad. And this this whole Damien Lucas thing kind of stuck in my crawl. And so yeah, after, Because an innocent person, it sounds like an innocent person is being set up. Yes. So uh, ultimately, of course, what I did is uh, when I went to court and was threatened with contempt, uh, I met with a judge in camera, in camera and... Um, and uh, basically, uh, we convinced the prosecution to drop the case against Lakeish Davis, and he was freed. But the real killers of Damian Lucas were still out there. And the whole thing was had a black cloud hanging over the whole thing because of this allegation of the uh, bribery that took place with Gil Hill and, and others. So anyway, I got transferred to a public corruption case or squad. And after that happened, you know, this whole thing kind of stuck with me. 
uh, at this point, white boy Rick had lost all of his appeals, and at this point he was about 21 years old, and he was sitting in one of Michigan's harshest state prisons, Marquette, up in Marquette, Michigan, up on the edge of the uh, of Lake Superior. And so I'd talk to him occasionally on the phone. So one day I went up to talk to him, and I said, um, listen, I know all this stuff took place. I know there were cover-ups that took place. Um I know who was involved in it. I know some of the corrupt police that were involved in it. I've got an idea. And so I developed the idea of Operation Backbone. And essentially what Backbone was, we uh, introduced um, through White Boy Rick and his sister, Don Worshi, introduced an undercover agent by the name of Mike Castro. And Mike had just recently uh, transferred to uh, Detroit from uh, the Virgin Islands. And so he knew a lot about, um, you know, the drug trafficking net in the Caribbean and so forth. So on Worshi's 21st birthday, uh, we arranged it for Castro to go visit with um, white boy Rick in prison under the undercover name of Michael Diaz. And um, following that meeting, um, Don Worshi, white boy Rick's sister, arranged to have a dinner with um, Mike Diaz and, uh, and herself. And uh, during that dinner, which was recorded, uh, Mike uh, started laying out that, uh, you know, basically he was a big time uh, Caribbean drug dealer and money launderer, and uh, they needed a contact in Detroit to continue continue their uh, criminal business and so forth. And, of course, uh, when Kathy saw that, her eyes lit up, and she said, hey, you know, I'm your girl. I know everybody in the police department of any importance. My father does, and uh, let us uh, let me help you. So that's how Operation Backbone began. And essentially, uh, we started flying in what, what they believed to be um, hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars of drug money, uh, taking it to fictitious banks, meeting with the corrupt police officers ahead of time, and recording those conversations, paying them uh, bribery money to protect uh, Diaz when he was coming with his load of money. And then ultimately, we start bringing in what they believe to be 100 kilo loads of cocaine in a private jet and flying it into Detroit City Airport. And they would arrange for transportation to Toledo, Ohio, to meet with other what they believed to be drug dealers uh, to pass the packages and so forth. There were actually other undercover uh, agents. But the people that we touched on that case were politically powerful people. It was the mayor's brother-in-law and the mayor's niece, Gil Hill and uh, James Harris and others. And ultimately, we ended up with about 16 subjects in the case, all of which were um, pretty high-profile police officers or public officials, and uh, it was a very highly publicized case. And in return for uh, Ricky's uh, support of this operation, we uh, agreed to, if he fit the bill, to take him out of state custody where he he was doing his life sentence and put him in the WITSEC program in federal prison with other federally protected witnesses where he could do his life sentence and if the opportunity ever came up where they would amend the state law that said that he was in for life with no chance of parole, I would come back at some point and testify on his behalf. So that was the arrangement, and eventually that's what we did. As you're doing this undercover case, and you, you have all of these you know, politically important subjects are, are re- related to politically important people, what is the purpose? What are you trying to... Uh, to gain information on. Are you still looking back at the cover-up of the murder of the 13-year-old boy? Are you looking at fresh stuff that they're involved in? Uh, Jerry, I would say both. We're we're really kind of taking the case where it leads us. Uh, But ultimately, you know, the predication for the case was this cover-up of the murder and so forth because... It identified, you know, corrupt police officers. So we wanted to reach out and get these people. So what we'd do is, um, <clears throat> for example, we'd have a meeting ahead of time with these uh, corrupt police officers in a hotel suite where we'd have it set up with video. 
and uh, Castro would uh, basically lay out the scheme. This is what we're going to do. Uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock p.m., we're having a jet. It's flying in. It'll be on the tarmac. We're going to unload this stuff. We're going to place it in the vehicle. We're going to drive it down to uh, Toledo or a place that we wouldn't even identify where it was. And in return, when it's all done, we'll pay you 50000 But for right now, here's $2,000 each, just so we get them on videotape. And then after we, we would do that a couple of times, we would express to Willie Volson, Kathy's father, and to Sergeant James Harris, who was kind of the ringleader, you know, we didn't trust that one guy. Get rid of him, bring somebody else in. And so we would always have sort of fresh meat, corrupt ah. meat, if you would. So, great uh, strategy. Just, yeah, yeah, so it uh, worked great. Wow, so how did white boy Rick get from being a 15-year-old who's feeding information about the Kerry gang to his father and him becoming a drug dealer himself, could you fill us in about how that happened? And, and I guess you're talking, I mean, the reason is he's named White Boy Rick, as I take it, is because he's one of a few white players in this Kerry gang. Is, is he a member of the Kerry gang? Well, he's not a member, but he, he was an associate. He would hang around with him. He grew up in the neighborhood uh, with them. He knew uh, Johnny and Leo Curry's younger brother, Rudell, and, and others. And they essentially trusted him because he was from the neighborhood. So he knew them all. But uh, going back to when he was 15 years old or so, uh, so he's hanging around with the Currys, doing all kinds of stuff, you know, providing his father with information. The father is relaying it to the Bureau. You know, I, I really didn't want to actively uh, work uh, somebody so young. So, you know, I went through the father and uh, never really tasked the kid to go out and make drug buys and so forth. But who knows what other agencies were doing? Uh, because he was, we found out later on, dealing with uh, Detroit Police Department, uh, DEA, and some other agencies. Oh, but at the same time? Yeah, same time. Uh, not with our knowledge, of course. So I think um, what happened is that uh, white boy Rick thought, hey, this is an opportunity. You know, I know some of these people in Florida some of these Cubans that are uh, involved in the drug trafficking, I can go down there, establish my own connection, uh, get a small front from them on the drugs, and, uh, you know, I can become a weight man. So that's what he did. He went down and he met with some of the folks that he knew from um, from other drug dealers and established his credibility with them. And uh, they would uh, essentially front him three or four or five kilos at a time. He'd uh, get the kilos back up to uh, Detroit. And then he would wholesale those kilos out. And he was doing this when he was about 16 years old. Of course, this all comes out later on. We don't know it at the time. As your informant, you're thinking he's on the periphery. He's providing you information about what other people are doing. But unknown to you and the, and, and the FBI, he now has established himself as a drug dealer. Yes, uh, that's true. But, you know, don't forget, uh, you know, we're not actively working him. Uh, in fact, his father, was, who was played by Matthew McConaughey, and it kind of makes me chuckle a little bit, I think in the Hollywood version they sort of uh, make him as a uh, struggling auto worker who's uh, trying to keep his family together and uh, so forth, but uh, that's not the fact. His father was a very obnoxious, opportunistic uh, individual who used his children you know, for profit. And so, uh, you know, I realized this, and I really – didn't need the father. I really didn't need the kid to develop the Curry drug case. I mean, we had wiretaps going. We had other informants. And so I stayed away from it uh, pretty much. But um, so anyway, uh, eventually uh, he, uh, you know, I start picking up intel, you know, that, that he was, you know, he was uh, involved independently uh, in his own uh, uh, drug operation. I mean, he didn't have crack houses. He didn't have a gang. Uh, but he was on his way for about a, a year and a half to becoming a you know a major player in the uh, city of Detroit. So how so, did he get caught? Well, um, you know I think it was kind of a setup, and I'm not sure why, uh, because the affidavits that I've read on the uh, by the uh, police department really uh, don't stand up to real scrutiny. And I think if he would have had a good attorney that uh, wasn't so politically connected. And, um, you know, filed some suppression hearings. It probably wouldn't have even made it through 
uh, you know, some of the first series of court hearings. But setting that aside, uh, he had a, uh, eight kilos of cocaine and uh, he had received the shipment earlier uh, the day before and had it stashed at his grandmother's house on the east side of uh, Detroit. And he was making arrangements to take a payment for, of about $30,000 for some of those drugs. And uh, he and another drug dealer were driving along not far from his house on the east side, and a police officer pulled him over, supposedly on a traffic stop. And the police officer's story is he looked in, he saw a bag of what appeared to be a large amount of cash. And a uh, struggle ensued. Uh, the father got, got involved in it. Uh, the sister got involved in it. And Worshi took off. And uh, he went to his grandmother's house where he had the dope stashed, and he put it someplace else. And it was under somebody's porch. And he sat near the porch and kind of waited for things to come down. Finally, the police officer who was searching for him, who had made the traffic arrest, found him. A search ensued of the immediate area. They found the eight kilos of cocaine, and that's what he was charged with. So it sounds to me that once he was caught up in this very harsh regulation for drug dealers, that you kind of felt sorry for him. Is is that true? Is that why you stayed connected with him? Well, uh, you know, I, I I don't know if, uh, you know, for the same reason that I became an FBI agent, and I think the same reason for you and a lot of other people became FBI agents, it's not about just locking up people. It's about fairness, you know, and, and integrity. And I knew that this was a BS case, and I thought the law that, that uh, he was uh, charged with was, you know, just really indefensible. I mean, it was draconian. You know, I mean, people who, you know, child rapists and murderers, you know, are convicted and get out in 10, 12 years. He was a bad kid. Don't get me wrong. He should have gone to jail five, maybe 10 years, but not for the rest of his life. So during this period of time when he's run around on his own kind of freelancing it, uh, Johnny Curry ends up being convicted and he goes to jail. Well, Kathy is still looking for that fast lifestyle. And even though white boy Rick is uh, quite a bit younger than than she is. He hooks up with her, and oh, they end really? up having a oh yeah. So they end up having a relationship, and they move in together. And um, so that's how Worshi White Boy Rick really firmly established his relationship with Kathy Bolson. But she was in it for the money, uh, she was in it for the drugs, and they did have a relationship for a period of time. And so you are working with him and using him, hoping to use him for your corruption case in order to help yourself with the corruption case, but also to help him possibly get some of these chains of this of this harsh life without parole regulations off of him. Yeah, that's part of it. That's a big part of it. So I'll give you an example, you know, how crazy this, this thing is. When he was in witness security in prison, He's in with all these these other you know uh, high profile um, criminals you know who have cooperated with the government. One of his friends or one of his cellmates or roommates was Sammy the Bull Gravano, and so Rick would put me on the phone occasionally with Sammy the Bull, and we'd talk a little bit. But one of the things I recall Sammy telling me, he said, he said this don't make any sense. He said this kid never pulled the trigger on anybody. He was just a dope dealer. There was no violence involved in it. I whacked 19 guys that I admit to, and I'm getting out in April. That doesn't make any sense. Please explain it to me. And as you can see, it's a, diff- it's a difficult concept to explain. It doesn't make any sense. So that's my motivation, really uh, kind of sticking with him. Now, I do have to say that while he was in witness security, we arranged for a transfer. From, he was in Phoenix at the time to another facility down in Florida so he could be on the East Coast and be his family would be a little more accessible. So at this point, he's probably got, I don't know, 15 years in prison, 13 years in prison. And there's no chance that the law is going to be amended. And um, somehow he gets involved in this uh, convoluted scheme uh, with some outside people and a couple people that that are in jail with him uh, to retitle stolen vehicles. And uh, he ends up facilitating uh, several car deals. And his story is is that 
uh, he was doing it so his sister could get some money and his mother as well. And uh, there was only about six to ten thousand dollars involved that he profited from. Well, as it turns out, the bureau on a, on a with Dade County had a uh, task force uh, going on on these group of car thieves, and he ended up becoming involved in it. So consequently, from inside uh, he, the jail, inside the jail, right? Wow. So he caught the case, and his reasoning is. Hey, I'm in here for life. I don't want my sister and my mother to be involved in this thing. I'll take the fall. So he pled guilty on it and um, received a five-year, not a concurrent sentence, but a uh, consecutive sentence to his life sentence, So, uh, which is problematic now. So fast forward a little bit. We go to 2003, and uh, this is prior to this car case being developed and so forth. And at this point, he's still in the witness protection program. They amend the law. And he becomes eligible for parole. Now, I've got about another year and a half, two years to go in the Bureau uh, before I retire. And, of course, I've been out of Detroit for a long time. There's new supervisors. There's new blood in the office, new SACs, new U.S. attorneys. And uh, they know a little bit about White Boy Rick, but not a whole lot. So I make, you know, I uh, attempt to follow up on what I promised him years before, and that would be that if they ever amend the law, I'll come back and testify on your behalf. So I met all kinds of resistance in this, you know, I, I just in, which I didn't understand. Normally, you know, the Bureau wants to demonstrate to informants that we stick by our word. Well, that wasn't happening. I was denied the ability to come back and testify on his behalf. It's a whole other story, but uh, basically it's politically motivated through um, the Gill Hill incident and so forth. But I uh, contacted the uh, defense attorney for Wershey, and uh, what I said is, um, you know, I'm having all these problems getting back there. What I need for you to do is subpoena me. And so I had his defense attorney subpoena me for the parole hearing. Uh -huh. And uh, basically, I paid for it myself. And I went back, and I got back there, and it was a media circus. They had everybody. You know, the print media, the electronic media, they had uh, Kid Rock was there to testify on his behalf. Uh, they had how a did, lot of how did, he know, how did he know Kid Rock? Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one, Kid Rock, of course, is from the Detroit area. And one of his first songs, uh, he talks about uh, having more money than White Boy Rick. And so uh, while he's in prison, uh, Wershey calls Kid Rock one time, and they establish a relationship. And so um, I meet with Kid Rock a couple times uh, with Wershey's uh, attorney, and we discuss what the strategy is going to be about, um, you know, him testifying and so forth. But uh, it was a uh, it was a circus. I mean, um, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office uh, decided they were not going to stand by and let this kid uh, out of prison, and. Um, it was it was crazy, and they basically ganged up. I mean, they had people testifying against Worshi uh, who didn't know him, didn't know the family, saying that uh, essentially he was responsible for all the ills of Detroit, and uh, and uh, basically the parole board turned him down. And that was in 2003. Now in 2005, he gets embroiled in this stolen car business, and they kick him out of the program, the uh, Witsec pro program, and he ends back in the state of Michigan, where he's doing his life term. So finally, uh, this year, actually, when this happened, it, it essentially, uh, he and I kind of became estranged, because I really felt that, uh, you know, he, I, he violated the trust I had in him. Uh, you know, I never really expected it. I, you know, I've dealt with hundreds of informants uh, through the years, and bad guys, and uh, this was the one that I really thought was going to you know, stick to his word, and he didn't. But about a year and a half, two years ago, we kind of reestablished a little bit of a relationship, and he finally became eligible for parole again uh, this year. And so I wrote a couple letters on his behalf to the parole board outlining what he had done in the past, and uh, on uh, June 8th of this year, uh, there was a another hearing, and uh, I went back and uh, testified on his behalf, uh, again, at my own expense. And uh, just last month, he was granted parole. However, he still has 22 months to do 
for the state of Florida. So we're not sure how that's all going to work out. But at this point, he's done almost 30 years in prison, and he's uh, 48 years old. He went in when he, w- he was arrested when he was 17. Uh, there was a documentary that that's called uh, White Boy that I actually participated in, and it's it's a pretty good and accurate depiction of the events that took place. And it debuted in um, Detroit at the uh, Detroit uh, Institute of Art on March 31st. So I went back there as part of the uh, film uh, producer's uh, guest and uh, entertained some questions after the show the movie. And uh, actually, it's a pretty good movie. And I, it's going to be on one of the premium channels here very shortly. But I think what they're trying to do, the producer, Sean Reck, is to pair it with the, uh, uh, the upcoming big budget film, White Boy Rick, which kind of makes sense. So, uh, but it'll be on Netflix or HBO or uh, Showtime or something. And it's it's a pretty compelling story. Uh, but I do appear in that as well. All right. Well, very good. Well, uh, we'll make sure that uh, when that comes out, mention it on the podcast or, or in my uh, reader team newsletter to make sure, sure people uh, are, are aware of it. So while he is in prison and he makes these introductions to uh, Diaz and to your corruption case, um, mm-hmm. it, it sounds like that paid off well, too. What was the result of that? Did uh, Were you able to charge anyone and, and did they do any time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We uh, we charged uh, um, Willie Volson, Kathy's father, um, James Harris, um, you know, police sergeant, who was sentenced to 30 years in prison and uh, eventually was uh, given a commutation of his uh, prison sentence by uh, President uh, George W. Bush. Um, And uh, he is out now. Actually, we've talked a few times. And here's a guy, you know, it's kind of funny, Jerry. You know, I'm I'm sure you've run across this where, you know, you put somebody away for a substantial period of time, and after they get over the anger, all of a sudden they start communicating with you. And it's like, we're not best friends, but but we're kind of like... Buds, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. And I'm sure this has happened to you and, and other agents where while they're doing their time, you know, do call you up or send you a note. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, uh, when I went back to this uh, film debut, uh, White Boy in Detroit, there was uh, probably 1,800 people that showed up for the debut of this film. It was like a big deal. And so following the film, uh, they asked me to go up on the stage with the uh, – producer, director, and uh, Johnny Curry um, was there. They brought him up on the stage, and they brought in a couple other people. And, and one of the people they brought up was a guy by the name of Nate Kraft, who was a hitman for the Best Friends Drug Organization and had admitted to at least 30 homicides. And his story, uh, at least on this documentary, was, this doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm good for 30 murder. I, I'm out. And uh, this kid's still in. Never pulled the trigger on anybody. So anyway, I'm up on the stage, and I've got Johnny Curry, who I locked up for 20 years, and, uh, you know, a hitman who did 30, 30, at least 30, and a couple other thugs, and they're asking me questions like we're, you know, on the Oprah show. And, <laughs> and I just had to say before the audience, I said, i got to tell you something. This is one of the strangest events in my life. I mean, Johnny Curry over here, I locked him up. I'm sure he hated me at the time. Nate Kraft over here pulled the trigger on 30 people. This guy over here went put to jail for 15 years. This is weird. And, you know, of course, the audience got a big chuckle out of it. But, you know, these things are weird. They're funny. You know, you never expect to be in these situations. But there we were. Well, if things work out well, it sounds like White Boy Rick may be able to make it to the premiere of the feature film about him. You know, it's a very real possibility. Um, You know, I talked to Ralph Maselli, um, where she's a longtime attorney, uh, just last week, and he's filed some motions uh, down in uh, Florida with the uh, sentencing court. And, uh, you know, he's optimistic that uh, something might happen here. But, you know, any way you slice it, any time that a 17-year-old goes to prison for 30 years for nonviolent crime, there's something wrong there, and it needs to be rectified. And, you know, I'm not some bleeding heart liberal, but I do feel strongly about this cause because it's just not right. I know here in in Philadelphia, uh, in the paper, uh, almost every week is something about 
the new laws about uh, juveniles being sentenced for life for violent crimes. And uh, many of those are are having their sentences um, uh, reevaluated and and are getting out. So, yeah, it's absolutely strange that we're talking about that situation for murders and and seriously violent crimes and nothing ever happened for, uh, for Rick for a, a drug violation. Yeah, but uh, again, there's uh, you know political motivation and uh, some vendettas that needed to be settled. Uh, coincidentally, uh, Gil Hill passed away uh, this past year, and um, you know up until that time, because he was never indicted on the case, it was difficult to talk openly about it. But um, again, the uh, major motion picture, um, it'd be called White Boy Rick, it's coming out uh, January 26th. It's with uh, Matthew McConaughey, Bruce Stern is in it, uh, Jennifer Jason Lay, uh, who I did some work with, um, you know, in, in uh, prepping for the position. She plays an FBI agent. And uh, also I worked with uh, Scott Silver, who was one of the original screenplay writers. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little uh, suspicious that uh, Hollywood may have put the personal anti-government twist on uh, the way the FBI is represented, but... And I haven't seen the uh, final product yet, so um, I'm hopeful that uh, Jennifer Jason Lee uh, tells me that that's not the case. But I have my doubts. You know, it is a formula that's always worked for Hollywood, and um, um, I'm hoping that it's you know my suspicions are not correct. But anyway, it should be an interesting movie. Uh, January 26th. It's called White Boy Rick. And who plays you? Don't tell me they didn't use uh, your character in the movie. Well, um, and this is what kind of makes me suspicious about, you know, them putting the Hollywood twist on it, um, because uh, they're they're concerned about the way they portrayed the FBI and, and me and other FBI agents. Um, basically, they have a composite of uh, two agents, one of which is Jennifer Jason Lee. And I, so I'm talking to her. I said, wait a minute. You mean to tell me they got a chick playing me? She said, well, hey, I'm a good-looking chick anyway. I said, all right. <laughs> That's just at the beginning of your career because then you move on to Las Vegas where right. now you're involved uh, as an undercover, as a, as a UCA, in right. dealing with the mob at some of uh, at some of the casinos. Yeah, yeah, it was... Uh... Uh, you know, I, of course, you know, when I got to Las Vegas, uh, nobody really knew me out in this uh, part of the country. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of background, a lot of experience. Um, I'd done a lot of several Group 1 undercover operations in Cleveland, uh, Pittsburgh, and other areas. And, uh, you know, and I actually managed, you know, a couple of them. So, uh, you know, I uh, kind of fit the bill. And uh, so when I got out here, uh, a case was underway. Uh, they had some issues with uh, 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 a uh, kind of a high-level informant out of the L.A. division, and they brought me in to kind of run around with him, and it was a very New York kind of a guy. And uh, we uh, kind of got along. We ended up opening a um, social club, and uh, by that time, uh, Carmen Milano, who was the underboss of the Milano crime family out of Los Angeles, had relocated to uh, Las Vegas, and we had an opportunity to get an intro to him. And uh, basically, I started running around with Carmen Milano and uh, his crew, and we did a lot of stuff together, and uh, eventually they all went to jail as well. So it was an interesting uh, career, and uh, I had a great time. Well, let me ask you this question, because I know you wrote a crime novel, and it's called Pigeon Spring. Right. How much of that is a true story or a fictionalized version of what you did in Las Vegas? Well, you know, there is, uh, there is, yeah, you got to, what they say is you're supposed to write about what you know, and obviously, and you know that, you know, you're an author yourself, uh, that's, that's what we do. And, uh, so it's kind of funny for a lot of people that really know the, the facts and the detail, uh, they say, oh yeah, I knew who you're talking about there. I remember when that happened. And, uh, uh, you put a little fictional twist on it, but you know why waste those stories? They're great stories. I, I get, I, you know, it's 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 um, it's kind of funny because when the book Pigeon Spring came out, it got a lot of uh, regional and local publicity. I did some radio shows and some other book signings and so forth. 
And um, it was featured one day on the front page of the Las Vegas Review Journal, which is the main newspaper here in this area. And uh, so at that point, I'm a security director at one of the casinos. And I know, you know, we have about 2,000 employees, but I know most of them, you know, at least by sight. So I'm walking through the casino one night, and uh, one of the bartenders calls me. He says, Heron, can I talk to you? I said, sure. So I go, what's going on? He said, i got to tell you something. This is really weird. I want to run it by you. And this is after I did some local uh, publicity stuff, you know, for this book. He said, I, after work, he said, I'd like to go to this uh, little bar called P.T.'s over here on South Decatur. Said, yeah, I know where it is. And he said, uh, you know, I walk in there, and I see this guy, and he's like holding court. He's got these women around him. He's got these guys, and they're hanging on every word he says. So he said, I had to go to the bathroom. He said, I went in. I came back out. By then, the guy had left. So I went to the bartender, who I do, and I said, hey, who was that guy? He said, oh, that guy is very, very interesting. He said, uh, his name is Herman Groman, and he's an author, and he's a former FBI agent. The guy was impersonating me. Oh. <laughs> It was funny. It was it was unbelievable. I said, well, you know what? I kind of like that because if, if I really go out and I screw up, I'm going to blame it on the impersonator, not me. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, obviously, you've had a fascinating career, and I really appreciate you sharing some of your stories. I'm going to give you the last word. So you can say anything you want about your career or the FBI. What would you like to say? You know, what I'd like to say is, you know, I feel so blessed, so fortunate to have been able to ex- been accepted into the Bureau and made it through my career without any major catastrophes happening. And, I'm, uh, you know, up until, you know, the day I left, I kept expecting somebody to come up and knock on my door and say, Mr. Groman, you kind of slipped through the cracks. You shouldn't have made it into the FBI. You're no longer an FBI agent. But that never happened. So um, I just feel so fortunate, as I'm sure you do and many others, that we've had that career. You know, it's it's amazing when you walk into Barnes & Noble and you go over to the uh, true crime section and you look around and you see books that are out there by people and you go, yeah, I remember that case. I had a little piece of it. I did something there. So it's unique. It's great. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Herman Groman. There's a photo of Richard Worsey Jr., White Boy Rick. And there are newspaper articles and a video about the case. So you might want to check that out at jerrywilliams.com. If you enjoyed the interview, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you at the bottom of the episode show notes. You'll find all the social media share buttons. And of course, if you are listening to this on your favorite podcast app on your phone or your iPad, you can share it directly from your device. I don't have a crime fiction recommendation for this week. I'm actually preparing for a two-week trip to the coast of Spain, and I'll tell you more about that in next week's podcast because I am going to have to take a week off at the end of that first week in October. Last thing, if you're over at Amazon.com and you want to check out Pay to Play as an ebook, trade paperback, or audiobook, I certainly would appreciate that. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.